Jessica has a ton of wonderful images to share with you guys today, so um, I won't belabor her um, introduction. Uh, my name is Michael Horsel. I'm the director of the gallery, and I work here at NIC, and I am delighted to have Jessica Bryant with us uh, today um, to share her incredible watercolor paintings with us, uh, as evidence uh, on the screen in front of you. Um, briefly, I made some quick notes, uh, but you can read more of this. She has a bio in the gallery. So if you want to read more about that, please do. Briefly, uh, kind of a little bit of overview. Um, she is a member of every watercolor society on planet Earth. <laughs> <laughs> Far from it. <laughs> <laughs> There's There's more. My work takes too long. I can't enter as many things. Oh my God. <laughs> Signature member of the American Watercolor Society. Is this the one that's like three? <laughs> I know. I know. I know. I know. Yeah, wonderful. National Watercolor Society, Northwest Watercolor Society, featured in a host of different magazines, um, international artists, American art collectors, Southwest artists, made just a couple of them. And then, um, and you'll see this in her bio too, she is an eight term artist in residence for uh, a number of national parks, the Badlands National Park, Joshua Tree National Park, um, Alaska, Northwest Alaska. National Park. Oh, yeah, she looks like the me. But just a really accomplished artist, and it's just a, bit of a delight to work with Jessica. And uh, I think the, the gallery really um, shows the work beautifully. So, um, right after the talk today, well, we'll go from one to two, and then there's an opening reception from two to four over in the bottom corner the gallery. Cookies and punch will be available. We'll be dancing. We're going to bring in some goats. It's going to be a <laughs> Class. So, uh, so uh, please join us afterwards at Stop On over there and you can talk to her a little bit more further. Um, but without further ado, I'm just going to introduce and let Jessica take over. So please welcome Jessica Bryant. Um, we are going to be slamming through this because we have one hour and I could stand here all day long. So <laughs> bear, bear with me. I'm going to try really hard to keep myself according to kind of plan. Um, I'm going to start with kind of an overview. I see faces that I know. So some of you, this is going to be familiar. Some of you, maybe not. Um, taking you way back to when I was a little kid, my mom went to school for music. My dad went to school for art. And I grew up loving both and did both heavily. Um, we did a lot of, my, my mom's parents uh, lived on a farm in central Minnesota. My dad's parents were um, in Kansas City. I grew up in Minnesota in the Twin Cities. And so visiting grandparents meant either two hours or eight hours driving. I got car sick. I couldn't do anything except look out the window. And I was, my sisters are so much older than I am that I was basically an only child. So there's nothing to do but look out the window, which served my later career very, very well because my, the, the way I adapted to being bored was learning how to not be bored by looking at stuff. Um, and my parents really played along with it and encouraged it something. Um, and I've realized as an adult that the way we talked was really kind of like high level art education trickled through my early childhood just because that's how my dad thought and saw the world. And so we were talking about composition, um, color theory, we'd you know, geek out over the, the reflected colors in a shadow and what was affecting here and there. You go into a room with white walls, they are not all the same color or the same value, lightness or darkness. And like my parents got into conversations about that with me. Um, not normal, but really fantastic and a really great, um, like I said, early childhood, you know, laying some groundwork for some of the stuff that's hardest to learn when you're older. Um, one of the things I never really occurred to me, my mom said something about this a few years ago. I did drawings like every kid when I was little, I think probably four or five years old, I'd perfected my little markers on lined notebook paper of a house and a rainbow and maybe a tree and the sun is there. And I didn't really think about it, I just did it. What my mom noticed was that my rainbow had to be in rainbow color order because people did them wrong all the time and it drove me crazy. Um, but she really wondered what was going on with my son because my son was a yellow sphere and then inside slightly smaller and off center was a big, bold, bright blue sphere. Um, blue in markers only being bold and dark, that was the only option. If you look at the sun, which you're not supposed to do, um, <laughs> you get that inverse image and it moves around. So I was drawing what I was looking at when I was tiny, I think just because this is how we talked about things and this was how I entertained myself. Um, but these are the things that if you, when you start learning how to draw or especially as an adult trying or an older child learning 
how to get into nuance of drawing with accuracy and so forth is learning to observe and learning to see. And somehow I got really lucky and had that going for me um, without even really trying. So gay for road trips and boredom and self-entertainment. Um, that was early childhood. I did all the things I could find with art. There'd be summer classes, things like that, art related. And I found these, so here you go. This is high school, um, my freshman and junior years. I did a lot of abstract work and I did a lot of surrealism and pastel was my favorite. I hated watercolor with a passion, um, a pretty significant passion. And this watercolor on the right was the result of an assignment when I decided that I couldn't stand the way we were supposed to do watercolor. So I went home and took a um, tin of watercolors my grandma had given me. And there were five colors. I think they were Pelican brand little cake pans from the 1950s. So they're already, you know, old and dried and cakey. And I had a liner brush. If you're not familiar, it's a long brush with very fine bristles appropriate for doing fine lines, like rigging on sails and stuff. I painted an 18 by 24 inch painting with that liner brush and my grandma's five color pelican and that's the painting and my art teacher's like, oh, you finally figured out watercolor. <laughs> yep. And he entered it in some shows and um, I mean, that's exaggerating. He was lovely. He, he was very encouraging and helpful. Um, it, it won best of show in a congressional show and went and hung in DC for a year. And I think I did one more watercolor and I was good being done with that because no to watercolor. Um, and just, I don't know, I think it's time and place, different mediums click with you differently, um, whether how you're introduced to them or how your brain is working or where you're at developmentally, what have you. Um, from there, I went on and just did life stuff. I went to college and who would study art because that's not a legitimate career choice. Right? So I started thinking astronomy, and then I was on to a bunch of different earth sciences and all sorts of things. Um, meanwhile, as I was undecided for three years, I took every drawing class they offered. Would have been nice if somebody said, hey, that might mean something. This might actually be a place for you to be, and there are ways to do this for a career. But sadly, I didn't get that information and had to find my way there later. Um, a step in that was actually here. So when I, um, after I had my bachelor's in American studies, which actually feeds my work very well, um, my husband and I moved here to Coeur d'Alene from the Minneapolis area. And I eventually worked here on campus. Um, and when you're an employee, you get to take classes for free and school is awesome. So why would you not take more classes if they're free? So I took philosophy and history and I took Michael's three dimensional design course. And this was a piece I made. I think we were allowed to use paper tape and string, which funny enough, when I was little, my mom would tell people that Jessica will completely entertain herself. All she needs is um, Kleenex, staples, and tape, and I would. I would make paper dolls and their clothes and all sorts of elaborate things out of really basic stuff. So this was kind of like, oh, I can do that. Um, and I remembered in elementary school, we'd crumple paper over and over until it was super soft. So I just got different patterned papers, and this is a very large um, three-dimensional paper quilt suspended from a rod and I hand stitched the whole thing. And if you turned it backwards, it's like a real quilt with backside is, has a couple different colors and stitching and what have you. And so that was here at Hung in the Library. And I think that one best of show in the student show. So um, another step in the, maybe this is what you should be doing. Um, while I was working here, I went to career services and took a lot of their tests on what things you might, you know, might be a good fit for you. Number one was always professional artist, freelance artist. And I would be like, oh, look down number five and six is like graphic design. Maybe I'll do that. <laughs> right. Um, so after we were here, I don't know, a few years, and uh, my husband got a job in Palo Alto. And so we moved for just a couple of years to the Palo Alto area in California. And our kids were really little. Um, I stayed home with them. After about a year, there was some disillusionment about what preschool and other things would actually look like with young children. And I started to lose a little bit of my sense of self. A catalog came in the mail for art courses. <laughs> There's a class on watercolor. I hate that. It's on Saturdays, I could do that. I'm gonna go do that. So I started taking a class in watercolor and this was the first painting I did in that class. And I looked at that and I thought, you know, it's not terrible. So I sent a picture to my dad and said, you know, I feel like if I really wanted to do this, maybe I could do this. And he said, yeah, I think you could. Cool. New career. 
I'm good. This is it. We're going to do watercolor, which is just totally ridiculous, but you know, time and place and where you are. Um, but what watercolor did for me at the time that it didn't do for me in high school, you know, when, when kids are little, if you've had kids or been around them much, there's not a whole lot of intellect involved in nap schedules and diapers and meals and so forth. And wow, if you've worked with watercolor, you know this stuff can be so intellectual if you want it to be. And if you don't want it to be, you kind of still can't help having to be a little bit intellectual about it. Um, so later in the year, after learning, um, we were going to move back here. And I remembered Art on the Green and thought, well, maybe I'll enter their jury show. So these were the two paintings I entered in the first um, Art on the Green jury show just after we moved back. Um, the one on the right won the Opal Bruton Purchase Award and is hanging at the Bridge Academy. And the other one you'll see in the show across the street. It's one of my favorite places and one of my favorite parks. Um, so from there, I started entering more competitions, just gradually built, my kids got into school, had a little bit more time, um, just really applied myself to painting, 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 painting. Uh, ended up taking courses from, or classes from Stan Miller, who lives in Spokane. If you know watercolor, you probably know Stan. Um, funny enough, my sister got me a subscription to a watercolor magazine while we were, when I was first starting. And an issue came and I really loved this one spread of this one guy's work. We moved back here and I was looking for someone to take lessons from. And I found Stan, I was kind of thinking, eh, I'm probably not gonna like his work. So I looked him up, it's like, wow, this looks really familiar. I pulled out the magazine, it's the same guy and he lives 30 minutes away, what are the odds? Um, it was fantastic. So I went to, he did a workshop on composition. It's like, well, we'll see if this guy knows what he's talking about. And he's phenomenal, one of the, the few people that you can actually have a really thorough conversation about composition um, with, which for an art nerd, that is just kind of a dream come true. Um, so I took lessons from him from just, for just under two years. Um, it started to get tough because I was entering pieces and shows and didn't want any input on anything I was gonna enter into a competition. And eventually um, we switched, I didn't take lessons from him and we did life drawing at Terry Lee's studio in town for boy, like 10 years or so until COVID. Um, and in the midst of all this, my kids, where we lived downtown and my kids were going to Sorensen, which is a magnet school for arts and humanities. I got roped into teaching an after school art class that I wasn't planning on um, and really pushed kind of that high level composition and values and learning to draw with, from observation accurately, um, all of those things. And I taught that for about 10 years and it was just fantastic. Um, and in the midst of that, that began my teaching experience, which has spread out to now I teach um, internationally for an online art school um, and around the country for online art schools as well. And I used to do, before COVID, did workshops in my studio. Hopefully I'll get back to those one of these days. Um, and I got into uh, doing different galleries too. I was with Art Spirit for a time. I'm with Coeur d'Alene Galleries and I have worked with um, Settlers West in Tucson. And as I was going through the, the competition circuit of things, my big goal was always the American Watercolor Society, um, which I would encourage you to read up on they are, personal opinion, they are kind of a penultimate for me. They're based in New York. They started in 1866, and they have had a, an international exhibit every year since. Um, if you look at the names of people who are in that international exhibition from the beginning, their names you see in all of your art history classes from France and England and the US. Um, former members are um, Winslow Homer, Edward Hopper, um, John Singer Sargent, Andrew Wyeth, um, Lots of, it's really cool. And they accepted women from the very beginning, which not everybody was doing at the time. Um, some were not a fan of that, but they really pushed hard to um, further the, the understanding of watercolor as a standalone quality medium, not just a sketching medium, but actually a you know, finished product studio medium. So these are a couple images. The top is the first painting I got into the American Watercolor Society, which was in 2013. And the bottom was a piece I got into the, earned my signature membership for the National Watercolor Society. And over in the show, um, both of these pieces are there, but there's also the piece that won my, earned my signature membership with the American Watercolor Society a few years ago. So backtracking a little bit, in the midst of all of that kind of overview of the things that I've, how, what my career has looked like, um, I fell into the artist in residence programs at the national parks. I loved the idea of being on my own, parking back to the road trip days, looking out the window, seeing rolling hills, and what's up past that hill, and what's past that hill, and I just wanna walk and walk and keep going and keep discovering and see all of these things. Sounds great to just get in your car, no plan, and just go. 
And this was like early days of cell phones, and I had little kids at home, and it's kind of like, the responsible part of me doesn't feel like that's necessarily the safest, best choice to make. And long story short, we were on a, a trip in um, the Grand Canyon, my family and I, and ran across their uh, gallery space for artists in residence work, and it got me into learning about this entire program. So some, not all parks offer a residency, and they're all a little bit different, the ones that do. In general, what, how this works is you apply if you're chosen. Um, you usually you get a place to live, usually within the park. Sometimes you get a stipend. You get time to explore and do whatever you want. You usually have to give back a couple of public programs of some sort. Sometimes it's working with kids and teaching. Sometimes it's just like a, an evening ranger program sort of a thing. Um, a little bit different every time. And then you usually have to donate some, a piece of work, sometimes a print, sometimes an original. And so I, in looking at all the programs, I chose to apply to Badlands National Park first, partly for um, the landscapes and largely for the program and how it worked. They gave you five weeks and a lot of parks you only get like a week and I really wanted to immerse myself. So, boy, I could talk for a week on each park. So <laughs> we're racing through this. So this is the ranger housing I got to live in there. My first residency with Badlands was five weeks long and went very well. Um, I got along really well with people who organized the program and others at the park. And uh, at the time, the park was trying to develop a program with the local tribe, um, which is a whole long story that I probably should not get into. And they decided to use me to help facilitate a relationship, formal relationship with a school on the reservation. And so they had me come back for a second residency and I went and taught classes, art classes for the high school um, on Pine Ridge Reservation for a week. Um, that was my second residency with them. And then they got invited back for a third and a fourth. And my last residency was 10 weeks of living in the park. Um, and boy, I, there's so much about this park that is just so fascinating as most parks are. Um, there's two, well, there's three units that make up the park as you maybe saw on that first map. There's a whole section of the show that's some of the work from a solo show I did on Badlands with a couple of displays. If you're interested, I'd encourage you to read those. And there's also some QR codes that link to a page on my website that has a whole lot more information. So if this is your thing, um, you can learn more there. Um, the south half, more than half of the park, was tribal land. Um, during World War II, the Army Air Force had use of a bombing range. So whose land are you going to take when you want to have a bombing range? Um, people were given little, if any, notice, at most 30 days notice to vacate. Um, I met a guy whose grandpa found out when they started flying the bombers overhead and he dove under his tractor to try to stay safe. Um, it just really did a lot of damage to um, the local communities and a big chunk of what was the bombing range is now the south unit of the park. There's unexploded ordnance. Um, there's tremendous fossils. If you ever go to New York and go to the American Museum of Natural History and you look at where the fossils come from for the, the um, Oligocene, one time period in particular, the bulk is from um, some of the formations in Badlands. And so while there, I also got to do some things with the um, biologists. Um, one was I got to go out for some black-footed ferret um, spotlighting. These guys are the most endangered land mammal in North America. And um, boy, are they a thing to try to catch and do health checks on <laughs> here. Um, there's a lot of really interesting things that happen in national parks behind the scenes that you would never see or imagine. And it's really fascinating the work that has to happen to try to maintain these spaces and to try to um, keep areas as natural as we can so we have places to study and places to visit and see and, and all of that. So for this, we're driving across the prairie dog town all night long with big spotlights trying to find eye shine. <laughs> and then you follow the eye shine to their hole, stick a cage in, drive away for a while, find that hole again for, with a reflector, and then hopefully you caught a ferret, maybe not. Um, I was also invited back, hired back actually, to photograph the bison roundup and participate one year, which is another just, again, driving across prairie dog towns, which you would think are this super sacred space. Um, bison are phenomenal animals, and I could talk about them so much. But again, in the interest of time, I won't. If you really, really, really want to know a lot, I do a daily blog when I'm on a residency in a park, so I have hundreds of blog entries from all of them, which are on my website. 
Um, but the bison are phenomenal. We would, every truck has a driver and a spotter and the spotter's job is to make sure the driver doesn't hit anybody else, either animal or another truck. And you are in a huge semicircle driving after the herd, trying to round them and get them towards the pens. If you go too fast, they split or they charge the trucks or craziness happens. If you go too slow, same, same thing. You've got to hit things just right. You get them in that gate, they close the gate and the herd will run, but then they'll turn and charge the gate back. So the first time we pulled up and did one of these, my driver said, go, 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 grab your camera, run to the gate. I'm like, what am I, so just go, go, go. So I'm sitting there, you know, <laughs> herd of bison running straight towards you <laughs> is pretty cool. <laughs> they turn, they don't crash into the gate or anything, but pretty cool. Um, so I'm not sure why that picture's in there. So here are some of the paintings I did from Badlands. Um, a few of these are across the street. Um, I think several of them have also already sold. But really a fantastic, I mean, what park isn't fantastic, but some phenomenal experiences in the park. And again, I could, so many stories that I would happily tell, alas. Um, and this was just from the, the solo show that I did at the end of my residency, focused on the South Unit, which is very under, um, represented part of the park and under known. Um, there's not easy visitor access. Um, it's on tribal land. So there's all sorts of different potential safety hazards and risks and cultural things. And it's, that's a, again, a whole nother talk. Um, if you want to visit the South unit, do some serious research before you go to make sure that you're respectful of everybody else who's out there. So my next residency ended up at Rocky Mountain National Park, um, which was the first park I ever went to on accident in college, um, on accident because I, I play bagpipes. I was in a band and we had a competition in SS Park just outside of Rocky Mountain. And one day a bunch of the older guys were like, hey Jess, we're gonna go drive Trail Ridge Road. You wanna come? Like, I don't know what that means. Well, just come, okay. Well, it's like the highest paved road, I think anywhere. It, it, goes along the top of the ridge, well above tree line, parallel to the Continental Divide. So you're looking down this huge valley at the Continental Divide. It's epic. If, if you ever go, I would highly recommend that drive. It's phenomenal. Um, and they were having their 100th anniversary, I think, the year. So it seemed like a great place to go next because it was my first park. And it's very different than Badlands, but absolutely phenomenal. Um, this particular image, this is the backside of Long's Peak, which is one of the 14ers in Colorado. In the back, the snow to the top of the peak, that's 3,000 feet. That takes two days to climb for the crazy people who climb that. They have to hang sleeping. Not my cup of tea, um, but just, you know, glorious mountains, sweeping views, really exceptional. And this is where I got to live in that park. So this was a store cabin built by a newspaper magnet. He hosted 10 presidents in this cabin, including Theodore Roosevelt twice. There's photos of him sitting in the rocking chairs that are still on the front porch that you get to just sit in and hang out. His typewriter's in there. It's really, really cool, but there is no cell service. There is no internet. There is no anything. You have like a 300 yard hike from where you park up to the cabin. And when the park staff came to introduce me to the cabin, they said, so we're really worried about fire with this cabin. So here's the thing, if you have a fire, what we need you to do is like run down to your car and drive to the campground, which is like 10 minutes away. Find the emergency phone and call so that we can, you know, like come out and battle the blaze. Like, at that point, I think we might, I think it might be lost. <laughs> like that's, that's a 20 minute process just to get you a phone call. Um, but the views are just absolutely outstanding. The elk herd would come down through the front. Um, that's the start of the Colorado River, or near the start of the Colorado River. Some marmots. We have marmots on Tubbs Hill. Um, pika. Those are the elk. Fantastic park. And here are some of the paintings I did from there. And this piece actually is. Um, headed to New York this spring. It was also accepted into the American Watercolor Society. It's my fifth painting showing with them. So then my next stop was the Western Arctic National Parklands. And I discovered or found out about these because I met a seasonal ranger at Badlands who did his summers up in Alaska. And he was weirdly standoffish for a while and then eventually warmed up to me. And basically his experience with artists and residents was kind of problematic. They 
in his experience, tend to be kind of needy, um, not very self-sufficient, and in Alaska, that's problematic. Um, <laughs> so it, it, long story short, he encouraged me to apply for this one, and I was lucky enough to get it. So the bottom dot there is the town of Kotzbue, which is where I was based. Um, there's no road access to anything in this region of Alaska, and those other two spots are the two bases that I was first flown out to. So again, down at the bottom, and then I also got a third trip, um, to, which is on the far left, just for context. So the green area at the top where you see Rainbow Lakes and Lawn Lake, the dark area up there is the size of Massachusetts, for context. And when we were out there, I asked and was told we were the only people there in the entire National Preserve. <laughs> so this is the town of Cotsview, and you can see kind of a, a line around. That's the road. It's an eight-mile gravel road, and they paved about two blocks of it when Obama visited. The road crosses, <laughs> and they put in a four-way stop that nobody knows how to use, which is very comical. Um, the road crosses the airstrip, so you have to watch for planes. They come in a lot faster than you would think. It's kind of disturbing. Um, so the first place they took us was a, a pair of lakes called Rainbow Lakes that are spring-fed and do not freeze. So there's a pretty hefty grizzly population year-round. And this is our plane taking off after dropping my friend, the park ranger, and I off. Um, the Rainbow Lakes did not disappoint. We had rainbows every day and weather like this every evening. It was absolutely unreal. And just like... You can't paint stuff like this and have it look right. <laughs> it's too perfect. Um, so this part of Alaska is tundra. There's some grizzly tracks. Um, we saw nine. This was the one that got closest to us. Um, my friend had to fire a, a round from a shotgun to try to scare him off. And you can kind of see that the grasses in the foreground almost give you an idea. I've got some better shots somewhere. Okay, well, that's a different story. I'll save that one. So this spot, I got out here, and my friend was taking pictures. And right after I was looking that way and taking photos, I looked down and discovered this little spit of land I was on. This is where, you know, Spring River comes through with a lot of force. Um, it was a good, like, 30, 50 feet straight down in the water, like, <laughs> starting maybe six inches from my foot. And it kind of, you know... It's not, um, these are not places a lot of people go, so you don't necessarily have the warnings of what things you do and do not want to do. Um, these are tracks from the Caribou Migration, which is pretty, this is the Brooks Range, the south end of the Brooks Range. Um, this, you can kind of see the plants. So the tundra plants are really fascinating. There's all sorts of things. There's berries we were eating constantly, which is just great. And there's grasses, and the grasses grow in formations they call tussocks, so like mounds of grass. Some are big, some of them are small. It looks like you should just walk on the top of these things. Um, I was told the best analogy is that it's like walking on bowling balls because they're not supportive. So if you try to step on them, you are going to just fall. So you have to step between them as best you can, but you can't see how deep it is. So you might sink this far and you might sink this far every step. So it's absolutely ridiculous. There's so much falling involved and it's wet and soggy under there. So you're in you know, loose fitting rain boots already trying to hike. And we would do these epically long days. The sun was only setting for maybe an hour at this point, I think, half hour. Um, so very, very long hiking days. And we'd like add it all up on the maps and like maybe we went two and a half miles. <laughs> it's kind of disappointing. Um, but really interesting to try to find a place to put your sleeping bag in that stuff too. Because like there you can kind of see my feet in between them. So you might find a place for like a hip and then your shoulders over here and your, maybe your head has a little natural pillow going on and maybe it's wet too. Um, so after four days in that location, they picked us up and flew us out to this. This lake is like a mile and a half long. This has, gives you absolutely no sense of it. Um, really fantastically incredible place. Um, and as we were out there, the colors completely changed. We went from spring to fall in eight days. So flying in, it was all the like summer greens and flying out was overcast and all the warm autumn colors. It was really cool. So a week or two later, I got to take along on another outing because they had a spare seat in the plane. So there are a couple of cabins that you can kind of make out in the middle there, which is where we're flying. Um, it's an old ranger station. Those are very leaky, moldy cabins that nobody in their right mind would stay in, but a couple of the fish researchers were there. So the park was sending staff out to restock um, this group of four fish researchers, a professor and his three grad students. 
and they're out in these Arctic lagoons, which are bodies of water separated from the Arctic Ocean by small spits of land, and they're nurseries for the fish population, natural nurseries. And no one has baseline data for much of Alaska. So they're trying to gather some of that. And they were discovering new species while we were there. They'd found a um, nesting Caspian tern, like hundreds, thousands of miles north of where they ever had been seen nesting before, which is kind of wild, um, but really cool. So these guys are in tents and leaky cabins for the entire summer. Um, and we got to go join them. So picture the little inflatable raft bouncing along the Arctic Ocean. You're hanging on to the ropes for dear life having been told you have 10 minutes survival time if you fall in the water, because it's that cold. Um, the jackets have built in uh, life vests. They're actually really warm and quite lovely. Um, so they took us, we got to take along for a couple of the different lagoons, which were really cool. And one of the trips was going along this river, and this poor juvenile swan was trying to get away from us and couldn't figure out to not go alongside of us. And his parents are circling, like, what is your problem? Um, but just like the evenings just turn so still and they're just gorgeous. And the cabins. So at this point, this was a little later in this, it was August that I was there, it was a little later in the month. So the sun was staying down for a three, four hours or so. So we finally were really getting into the serious northern lights. And this night, I, my camera setup is not meant for night photography. So these do not begin to do it justice. But I was told by the, the people I was out there with, and some of them were, grew up in Alaska, that it was the best northern lights they had ever seen. And it just would not quit the entire night. And just before I took my camera down to go to bed, like 3 a.m., I looked up in the midst of this stuff. And it was the most disorienting experience because it feels like the curtains are coming down right alongside you. And yet you can see all of the stars and it's like inky black in those dark, like I said, this does not do it justice. It's like inky black with these constantly moving curtains around you. Very, very disorienting. So this is the view. My friend's house was across the street from the ocean. Like who gets to have the Arctic Ocean right out their door? So I'd go down for sunsets and my first night, I, they were, it was you know, 11, 12 o'clock at night, and they were going to bed, and it's like, oh, I gotta go catch that sunset, because I'm here, I can't miss this, I'll be back in half an hour. Not having thought about the physics of sunsets <laughs> when you're close to the poles, that sunset, I finally gave up after like an hour and a half or two hours, because all it did is get better. I mean, the sun is just easing along, it was just more and more and more intense color, and every single night was like this, it was just crazy. Those, um, the landforms out there in both of these is uh, where those ranger cabins were. But just phenomenal. So then here are some of the paintings that I did from up there. And a couple of these are in the show across the way. Sorry if I'm going quick. And then next I ended up at Joshua Tree. Um, again, from a connection and from luck, the. Um, Chief Ranger for Interpretation at Badlands had taken a job at Joshua Tree and she'd brought her education specialist with. And they, for different reasons, need to restructure the arts and residence program. And they wanted to add in an education component because in California, they don't have art classes for kids in schools uniformly. And they wanted to at least change that for the local kids. They're already in a rural area. They don't have access to these things. So they wanted to add in a component where the artists who come would be talking um, with the kids and teaching kids and doing stuff. So they knew, they had watched me do this in Badlands and liked how I worked. So they asked me to come consult, who's gonna say no? Um, so I got to go down for oh, a week and a half and we had a lot of meetings and, and looked at a lot of stuff. And then they gave me the first two residencies to kind of show examples of how this could be, help build some relationships, um, all that good stuff. And I love deserts a lot. So it was really, really a phenomenal experience to get to go have extended time um, in these places. I love everything, really. I like, I like how things relate and interact with each other and relationships and contrasts. And the world is a fascinating place. <laughs> this was one where I got in trouble. That's a little bit of a, that's a dry fall down the middle there. Really easy to hike down not actually so easy to hike back up. <laughs> I made it, <laughs> it was not easy. Some bighorn. 
and I got to go out in the field with the biologists. They had to replace some of the transmitters on their desert tortoises, which was pretty fun. So we tracked down two of them, um, Liz and the dude, <laughs> their names, which is great. Um, another just really fascinating animal species. They're so cool. And a few paintings. I think this one's across the way too. And this one I just finished. This is a new one. Um, and somewhere in here, a friend of mine um, forwarded me an application and information about an in-state residency for the Bureau of Land Management down in the Owyhee Canyonlands area, which I had never heard of. Um, they're really cool. There's five wilderness areas combined together. Um, they were offering a residency program. I lucked out. They chose me, so I got to go. And uh, I got a week out with a couple of the, the two, at the time, wilderness rangers down there. Um, one of whom's a sculptor, so we had fantastic conversations about art and the world and philosophy, and we fixed everything in our minds you know, <laughs> in a week of hiking and exploring and talking about all the issues in the entire world. And um, I also, they had me come back to do a spring river trip. So the wilderness areas down there are all based on a bunch of different rivers, and a lot of them are really well known for whitewater rafting. Well, because it's Bureau of Land Management and there's cattle ranching all around, they, if, if you're not familiar, cattle do a lot of damage in a riverbed if they're left there over the winter. It's wet, it's damp, their hooves, they go everywhere, they eat everything, they really make a mess and can damage an ecosystem. So they have to make sure every spring and fall that everybody's where they're supposed to be. So they have river rangers who have to kayak or um, stand-up paddleboard, even when it's dry, they have to carry their stand-up paddleboard and hike along every single mile of river through the wilderness areas. So I got to do a, a three-day trip with them, which is really cool. Um, but I only have a few photos because my phone's memory card decided to not work and I lost everything. <laughs> so five, fiction, five photographs. It's okay, I got some paintings out of it still anyways, and it was, it's all up in here. It was fantastic. But beautiful area. A lot of it looks like this. It's high desert, flat, and there's these dramatic chasms where the rivers are. This is, um, you might recognize it from an earlier slide. This was the piece I had in the National Watercolor Society, and this is from, from down there. And then in 2018, I was the artist in residence for the Idaho Conservation League, which is a really cool organization. And these are just a few. This is from that river trip. So just a few of the paintings I did for them. My goal had been to do every wild and scenic river in the state. And I managed to have paintings from most, but I couldn't do the trips I wanted. I ended up having back problems and had to have surgery that year. So that kind of destroyed the hiking. Um, so overview of, of residencies. Um, in this time, when I look at this experience, and I'd like to do more of these, it's really phenomenal to have the, ex the opportunity to kind of set some of your life aside and focus on one thing and get to be in a really unique, amazing, beautiful area, but even more to have access to resource experts and to learn in depth about the place you're at. And all of those experiences um, gave me space and time, but also the, the interactions and the conversations to start to kind of figure myself out as an artist a little bit. Um, when you're learning something new, or it's no different, you know, there's a certain amount of skills you have to develop before you're really getting into anything particularly high end as far as thought goes. And my residency experience kind of happened right through that transition where I went through I don't even know how many existential crises over different issues with my work. Um, everything from, well, why are you painting realism? Why are you painting landscapes? Why is this so traditional? Why you, know, you think about all these other things? And what about politics? What about philosophy? What about how can we not doing people? How can we not? And there's noise and voices everywhere. So this wasn't just internal. Other people, other places, you know, we, we can't help it. No matter what you do, somebody will naysay or have some other idea of what you should do. Um, and it took me a, a lot to start to be able to trust my own voice and to start to get a little fed up with how much I was letting myself be swayed with things. Um, and the, f the first one of those was when I was learning with Stan and I was having a hard time, I think because I was working in realism. And because when I was younger, I did a lot of abstract. And there's kind of this 
very odd separation in the world between abstract and realism. And man, if you don't have good abstract design in your realism, you're not actually making good realism. Abstract design, your composition structure, is the heart and meat of all art across the board, whether you're a writer or you know, a filmmaker or a musician or a visual artist, um, that is universally the, the anchoring structure, the, the one linking thing. You know, we can go, most of us can recognize that a summer blockbuster is gonna be a different film, kind of film, serve a different purpose than say something that might show at the Sundance Film Festival. Sometimes there's overlap, sometimes there's not. One is not necessarily better than the other. They serve different purposes. Um, and art is, visual art is, is no different. Boy, I could get on a soapbox that I don't want to do because we're going to run out of time. Um, anyways, this is one of my crises. So I spent two entire days Googling painters and just looking at artwork. And at the end of two days of doing this, I went back to Stan Miller and I said, you know what, it all looks the same. It all looks the same. It doesn't matter what it is. We only have so many colors we see. We perceive the world in so many values, lights and darks, black, white, grays. There's only so many different shapes. There's only so many different configurations of shape and space you're gonna to use to make a thing. There's no point trying to like do the newest, greatest thing. It's, it's all already out there. So if that doesn't matter, then it comes back to, well, what is it you feel like you need to create and why? And that why is, is I think, a lifelong, ongoing, um, malleable, changing thing. Um, my residency experience has helped with that because one piece for me, I've always been drawn to landscapes even when I was really little and again, that could be a whole nother talk. Um, you know, the visual world was sort of my safe place and place to escape and I saw so much landscape on these road trips because we were driving through farm country and there's just something about landscape, you know, it's our, it's our native habit, natural habitat. I think we have an inherent connection and there's a universality to landscape, but it doesn't mean that that's the only thing it has to be. Just because you want to paint landscapes doesn't mean that you're a you know, brainless, uncreative person who's just copying a photo and just making a pretty picture and that's it. Heavens no, there's so much you can put into anything you make, right? There's analogy and metaphor and so many different components of things that might go into what you choose to create. And just because you have an image that you're going to copy doesn't mean it's a good image to copy. You better understand your composition and your value structure and all of these layers of things. And that's unending. You can intellectualize anything you want to intellectualize as much as you possibly want to. And if you're weirdo like me, that kind of never turns off. And then that's almost a whole nother avenue you get to go down um, I work pretty slow painting like this. Um, oh, I didn't even get to this section yet, oop. Um, painting the way I paint takes a lot of time. That's opportunity to you know, observe, really invest in my subject, understand it. Yeah, I've painted leaves before. I haven't painted that leaf before. What's happening? What's going on? Why is it doing this? How is light working? How is color working? How are the values working? How are these relationships? Why does it have the feel it has? Why does this kind of a sky make me feel like I'm cold and that kind of a sky makes me feel like I'm warm. And I mean, this stuff never ends. So I'm jumping around because I forgot I had this whole section. Um, closer to home, I realized after um, my kids got older and I wanted to stay closer to home and it hit me, why could you not act like you're on residency at home? It's not like we don't have the landscapes here. Partly moved here because I love it. And so I'm, I still don't function as if it's a residency. I don't have nothing to do all day but hike 12 miles <laughs> most of the time. But I try to get out pretty regularly. And there's so many areas just for a day trip. Man, you can go up Moon Pass and along the whole Joe all the way out to Spruce Tree and back. You can do a whole lot in just a day. And if you give yourself a night to camp, there's even more you can do. So this is Lower Salmon River at Fall Creek. And if anyone's interested, as a thank you for coming, I've got extra postcards that I'll bring over to the gallery of this one, because I have them. Um, Placer Creek from the Pulaski Trail over in Wallace. Um, the Upper St. Joe River. Some waterfalls that are not easy to find, kind of near Moon Pass, which are super cool. The rocks are like cantilevered overhead. Again, the St. Joe. I love this particular spot, you'll see it again. <laughs> Mineral Ridge. This one, which you probably saw on the postcard and it's um, the original is on loan from the clients who purchased it. Very kind of them to 
let the world see it. They purchased it the day after I posted it online after painting it, so it never got displayed publicly. Um, this piece hung with the American Watercolor Society last year, and it's currently part of their traveling exhibit, so it's going to five different galleries around the country. And I just love that, like, there's a little North Fork hanging in Florida right now. <laughs> it was in California. I think it goes to, I don't know, Tennessee or something next. Um, North Fork Coeur d'Alene again. A little further down, but the same area. And this was the piece, this is Tubbs Hill, which is a personal favorite of mine. Um, I live probably a five minute walk from my front door to the trailhead, um, and I got talked into joining the board of directors, oh, I don't know, 10 years ago, something like that. Some of them are here is why I'm looking off to the side. Um, I kept that painting, it's across the street, that earned my signature membership with the American Watercolor Society and also toured with them for years, so that one is close. I don't keep very many, but I chose to keep that one. And then this one is a new piece that's headed to the March in Montana Western Art Auction um, next month. All right, so back to what I was talking about, um, my existential crises. Um, a lot, you know, so many different things. And people will ask you anything like, well, why watercolor? Why don't you paint in oils? And man, every year I sit at a booth at Art on the Green and it's so fascinating. It's like, okay, who's it going to be this year? Because I always have somebody trying to tell me how my work is real art because it's representational and that abstract stuff. And it's like, well, actually, the abstract component of my work is the most exciting part to me. <laughs> so I would love to have a conversation with you about that. Um, and then people will do the opposite, like, eh, it just looks like photographs. It's not real art. Uh, you know, because we all have different opinions. And, you know, I've heard so many different things from so many different people. At, that, at this point, I think the comments people make says so much more about where they're at and how they're feeling about things. And the reality is there's room for everything. There's lots of reasons to paint. You could paint for just you feeling good, and it doesn't have to look like anything. Nobody else ever has to see it. You can aim to be one of the best painters ever and put your work everywhere you find it. Whatever you do, you're never going to please everybody, and someone's going to have something to say about things that you make. So at this point, and what I try to encourage my students, is you have to figure out how to listen to yourself. So where I've come to with this at this point is, for now, who knows, my work might look completely different in 10 years. Maybe it will be you know, like Franz Klein abstract, just big dark lines. I love them, so maybe, I don't know. Um, but for me, I, I love the, the attempt, the struggle to figure out what it is about an experience, because it's not just that I was here and snapped a photo. It's I sat here for a long time, and I've been here many times over, and I love this spot, and it feels so different different times of the year. The way the water moves, there's a deep pool over on the one side. It looks like a whole different river when you look upstream versus downstream. All of those things, the way the light plays across the water, the water, the way water moves around rocks, all of these things, I can sit and be so endlessly fascinated by any one component for so long. And then what thoughts are going on in my head besides just that? Am I having a rough day? Did something really cool happen? Am I dealing with a personal struggle related to my art or not related to my art? And all of that is going to affect the experience that I have in that place, that day, in that way. So sometimes that's what my work is about, where Whatever it was about that experience feels like the thing I need to put onto paper, but then how do you do it? What is it? Because it's not just copying the photograph. Camera lenses don't perceive the same way our eyes perceive. Um, you know, what, what adjustments can you make with color or value or composition or structure to craft a feeling, a mood, an experience for somebody looking at it that maybe gets close to what I felt? Only it won't because they're not me. And that's, I, that's what I love about having not people. I'm asked that all the time, too. Like, you know, your work would sell better if you put people in it. Like, cool. <laughs> cool. And I've heard artist instructors say things like, oh, yeah, well, you can resolve that with a figure here. And figures are your entry point. If you put figures in, it gives people a way to, um, to understand the story. Because if you see somebody else in the painting, you put yourself in their shoes and you feel like you're experiencing where they are. Maybe if you're extroverted, because that's not how I experience that. When I look at a painting with people in it, I feel like I'm an observer of those people, and they're doing their whole own thing. And depending on maybe their body language, I might feel like 
sure, I can feel a connection. And sometimes I might feel very like I'm going to hide in this corner as I observe this painting. Um, so, so much is so personal into how we respond and react to things that, again, I don't think there's a way that you can universally say, here's how you should do this or that or the other thing. More it would be, oh, hey, your composition is out of balance. You need some a value shape over here. You could accomplish that with a figure or a rock or a tree or a mitten or a mailbox or any number of you know, things. But the issue isn't that you're missing subject matter. Subject matter is so secondary, if it's even that. I mean, we see it and we understand it if it's representational work. And so we attach ourselves to subject matter because it's understandable and it's relatable. And I think that's where work with figures is really relatable too, because we can relate to people. We know how to relate to people. Abstract maybe feels less relatable for some people. Um, I like doing empty landscapes because for me, Anybody who looks at this gets to have their own experience and story and narrative. And it's just about them and the place, which is what it is for me. It's me and the place. It's not, I don't want to insert my narrative and my story onto somebody else because that's the amazing thing about visual art. I can put anything I need to say into something I made and I don't have to tell anybody else what any of it was. It can be you know, fun and happy. It can be sad and depressing and miserable. <laughs> Whatever I need to say, I get to do that, and I don't have to share that piece unless I really want to. Somebody else can come in and have a completely unique experience for any number of reasons. Maybe they know the place, maybe they don't know the place. Um, I think that's phenomenal. I think that's the, the beauty of what visual communication is. It's not using words, it's not using sound, it's just using the visuals. And for me, that's cool too. So there's a whole lot of different pieces that I pull into with my work. Um, my work is very much composition driven, um, which that could be, again, a whole nother talk. I um, think those were, those were the big ones, big things I wanted to make sure that I covered. Um, I want to have time for a few talks, or a few talks, a few questions, if anybody has questions. Um, I do have, if you all come over to the, the gallery, we can continue questions and talking. I'm there till four, so don't hesitate, please. I enjoy talking. I enjoy meeting people. Um, does anybody have questions? Yeah? How long does your average painting take? Oh, that's what I forgot to say. Um, <laughs> depends on the size and depends on what it is. So a piece that has a lot of blank space around it or very minimal is probably going to take less time than something that has um, a lot more what, what people would think of as detail. It's not necessarily detailed, but things that seem like detail. But also because it's watercolor, you're preserving whites by painting around them and you're preserving and creating light shapes by the negative space, the dark shapes around your lighter shapes. So the more you have small nuanced light shapes on top of dark shapes, the more time consuming it's gonna be. So like this was probably, and this is a pretty large piece. Um, this wasn't actually too bad, maybe 60 hours, 50, 60. Um, I've got some that I've spent 100 hours on. And 100 hours is the active painting time and the reality is that's more like four or five weeks because there's also, you know, there's a production side of being an artist and then there's the business side, which sometimes is like 60% of your work and 40% is your production and you still have, you know, so it, you're only paid for the, for the production side, sadly. Um, so those 100 hours, even if it's, you know, I could have a, an eight hour, often I have 14 hour work days um, and I'm sitting at my studio, there's also the looking at it, does this work, does this not work, and you know, now I'm gonna look up something over here, double check that, or look at another image, or other things. <laughs> yeah. I have managed to finish a painting, in a, a studio painting in a day, but I think it was about 14 hours, and it was <laughs> not very big. And there's a, there's a diminishing returns on size. Bigger does not necessarily take longer. If you get smaller and smaller at some point, to give the illusion of the same kind of um, form and structure takes so much more time because you're having to cram more different values into a smaller shape where there's kind of an in-between that's a little bit quicker where you know this much space is a little bit easier to do a dark to light than this much space. But then you get really big and now you're having to make sure that has textures and all of these other things going for it too. So a while. I probably can, I think I average around 20 paintings a year. Varied sizes, some are small, some are big. Some year, last year was a pretty robust year. I think I had like 20, 
five or so, something like that. Yeah. I don't really understand what you mean about even the realistic starts with the abstract. Yeah. Can you give an example? Absolutely. So um, the simplest way, which is hard for a lot of people to understand, um, but I'm going to say it anyways, everything in our visual world is abstract shapes. Everything is some kind of a shape, and there's larger shapes, and there's smaller shapes within larger shapes. Um, each of those has a value, a lightness or darkness, and has a color to it. When we organize shapes in certain ways, then they start to mean something to us because we've been taught to think of those as a subject matter with a label, person, dog, what have you. Um, but like this, if you squint at this, if you really, really, really squint, you can start to see there's large, darker masses, there's medium value masses and there's lighter masses. And the distribution of those is the composition, is the abstract design. So if I were to simplify this down to just black and white, if I had to choose, is this shape black or is this shape white, that's really, really oversimplified. Um, but that's kind of the heart of the structure of what's going on. So if you look at, um, more, I mentioned Franz Klein is a great example. He had a body of work that's white canvas with these bold black brush strokes, but such an interesting way of dividing space and um, interesting textures in the brush strokes and things. It's all about the balance of shapes and value and texture. And that's happening in things that we can identify as subject matter that we recognize and we have labels for. It's all still there. It's just that we don't see it because we've been trained to think about the names of the things. And that's, I, I think, for most people who delve into a lifelong study of art, that becomes a thing to have to figure out how to wrap your head around this different style of observation. Um, learning to draw, it is so much easier to draw when you're not even thinking about what the subject is. You're just looking at shapes and edges and proportions and just mimicking what you see. Does that make sense? Kind of? OK, OK. Again, like I could spend a whole day on, on just that. More questions? Did I see? I thought I saw another hand. Maybe not. No? We can catch. Yeah. Well, you mentioned photography. Yeah. And I'm wondering how you think about photography vis-a-vis -vis painting. You know, do you see yeah. this as a sister media, as it were? Well, they're both visual media. So, yeah. so yeah. Do you see them as related or do you see them as distinct and different? And then how do they overlap? I mean, do you use photography in your work? I do. Help you see or help you remember? And how do you think about the difference between a photograph, a photograph and the actual viewing experience? Yeah, those are fantastic questions. Um, I spend a lot of time thinking about that, exactly. Because there's also a whole set of messaging out there that if you're basing your work on photographs, you're illegitimate as an artist. I'm finally past that one, too. That was another existential crisis for a time. Um, when you, uh, the eye perceives differently than the camera lens. I see cameras as a tool. They are a medium by themselves. And you can do abstract work with cameras. You can do, you can, handle them, say, let's just limit to landscapes. You can handle photography in ways that really push into abstract, unidentifiable, and you can handle it in ways that really start to feel closer to how, I, how our eyes perceive and everywhere in between. And then it's up to the individual photographer to decide how they want to manipulate the tool to produce images that they want to produce. So in that way, it's a lot like painting. My tool is paint and brushes. Um, there's different controls that work differently, but we've got photo manipulation. You can you know, get on Photoshop and you can change colors and change values and add things and move things around, much like I can do with you know, paints and changing things from what I see. Um, so I, I see that they're, they're both visual art forms, so I, I think they relate to each other very much. Um, but they're also different and work in different ways. So might use one for some things, another for other things. Um, as a painter of landscapes, I will say that there are some things that a camera can capture and the public will believe it as, wow, that's amazing and so cool. And if you paint it exactly like the photograph looks, it looks fake, artificial, and you look like a fraud. And that's a whole thing to learn what, what, you know, what things are 
close enough to how most people have a visual library of experience that it fits and feels right versus that's a little too unique and doesn't quite fit what I feel like I've seen before, so I don't feel like I trust that that's really real as a painting. Um, but what else do you ask? I do use photography. Um, I love photography. I had a lot of fun with it before I ever started picking up um, painting. And early with kids little, painting on location, there are plein air outdoor art painters that work with their little kids running around somehow. That is not my temperament. I can't handle that. Um, so I did a lot of studio work with photographs and I still, 100 hours on a painting, I am absolutely using photographs. Um, my photography changed after I became a painter and evolved for a number of years based on what I was looking for to support what I wanted to do in the studio. Um, and I also got better and better at learning what I have to pay attention to from life that the camera is not going to catch right. And you have, I think no matter what you do, if you're basing your work on photography, eventually you will learn, hopefully, your own personal approach for not taking the camera literally as the one thing to stick with. I mean, you can. And there's nothing wrong with that. I don't think there's anything wrong with anything. I mean, why are you making what you want to do? You've got to like it. So if you just want to exactly copy photographs and that brings you great joy, then that's absolutely what you should be doing. Um, if you're trying to make work that really feels like your own and is not just mimicking something else, then you get into the whole fun of learning to figure out how much of this am I going to hold, how close to, and why, and where. And if you put every last detail that a camera lens might pick up, it might feel kind of artificial because our eyes don't perceive reality that way. We don't actually focus on everything equally all of the time. Our eyes move around and we pinpoint different things for different lengths of time and different amounts of focus. And so you can play with that and how am I going to find my, you know, things. And if the camera's all, photograph is all in focus, well, you've got all the options because you can see all of the things. Um, does that answer enough? I feel like I could keep, I could go on for a very long time. Well, I think we are out of time, and I think you guys probably love to go to the gallery and actually look at this artwork. So I want to yeah. thank Jessica. Yeah, thank you. Thanks.